Hi. I want to talk about historical trends in, in plucked string instruments, and I also want to talk about how uh, people now are reinventing the wheel without even knowing. Um, people come up with the same ideas centuries apart, and because most guitar players now um, don't look backward more than 100 years or so into music history or into the history of their instrument, and even if they do, they never the ones in the U.S. never look past the Mayflower um, to the old world. Like they, they don't learn anything. So um, I want to I want to share you I, with you what's already been done, um, specifically in Europe in the 17th century. This is a copy of an instrument from 1614. The original is in a museum. It is called a theorbo, a theorba, or um, kitaron, a, a large kitara. Kitara, kitarone. One means big, and it is big. Uh, th this um, angle is foreshortened. This thing is um, as tall as me, so over six feet tall. Why? For bass. Um, back then, strings for, for lutes and other things uh, were gut, uh, sheep gut, even though they called it cat gut, um, but no cats were harmed. Um, they didn't wind metal around the strings yet. That came about in the, the, the later half of the, the 17th century and um, became more and more popular. If you want bass, you need length. Um, if you want it to be strong and punchy and zingy and, and loud, you need, you need it to be long. It's just like taking a trombone and unwinding it. It would be very, very long. Um, to get a to uh, get a long uh, resonant uh, chamber of like a, a column of air. It's the same idea with, with strings, except you can't wind them up like that. So what people did later was they condensed the strings by by overspinning them and making them denser, and they would um, still be able to get a punchy bass that was loud and powerful, but they wouldn't have to make these absurd long instruments. I will say that since everything is um, overspun these days in the bass range, like it's, you see it everywhere, um, people now no longer know what they're missing unless they um, get into historical instruments or copies of them, like this. Um, uh, they, 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 their, their scope of experience is very narrow uh, because they're looking at a very narrow period of history. But if you start going back, well, I'm going to flip this video, so um, you, you, you understand larger trends across, his, uh, across um, centuries. Basically, over the centuries, um, instruments got tighter and higher pitched and louder and, and um, um, stronger and more tense. Um, that's the general trend with, with strings. Due to uh, better string technology, uh, due to overspinning, um, due to demands, uh, like um, this instrument is basically a Renaissance lute, which was a, a domestic instrument for playing inside, um, a, a Renaissance lute that was adapted for the stage for the new um, opera that came about in the in 17th century Italy. So people were trying to revive uh, Greek lyric poetry, but instead of just strumming a lyre, they, uh, they um, took bass lutes and, and extended them. Like this, this is basically a bass lute that stops here, that has the regular pegs, peg box, but then with an extra extension, it adds an octave to it of contrabass strings. That was the 17th century edition. Um, and it, it suits the, the, the overarching artistic uh, movement of mannerism in painting, um, where people abandoned the, the um, aesthetics of the Renaissance, which were all about balance and proportion. Um, and they, they went for elongated figures that were almost superhuman for, for the sake of drama and emotion and expression. It was like exp um, expressionism that would come around later. Um, so the instruments themselves in, in music under, underwent uh, gigantism, and the harps got really big too. So this thing is absurd, and it, um, it, it's just 
there's no polite way to say it. I, I, I had a hinge put on it so I could fold it in half and store it in an airplane, because otherwise it's too big to fit. It's invented before the airplane. Okay, so I've got a base octave, a contrabass octave rather, G. That sounds like F sharp if you have um, perfect pitch because I tuned a semitone lower than the modern standard. People like me who are um, in the, the camp of historically informed performance um, will tell you that people tuned to A equals 415 hertz in the 17th century and thereabouts. That's BS, it's not real. Um, people, there was no standard. People tuned to the local organ and the local organ would shift after people tuned it. Um, we have these global standards now, but it, the world was smaller back then if you're looking at European music. And there were, there were regional trends. Uh, string players could always adapt, but, but woodwind players had trouble and they had to transpose and stuff. So what happened was in the 1960s, um, the, the young countercultural generation of classical music players wanted to um, kind of rebel against the establishment and get back to the roots of um, classical music and earlier music especially. Uh, music from the, um, uh, the Baroque period, the 17th and early 18th century, and then prior, the Renaissance, the 15th and 16th century, and then prior, prior, uh, the medieval period. Um, going as back as we have uh, records of music, um, but polyphonic and harmonic music kind of starts to pick up in the 12th century, but we've got stuff going back earlier. Um, but like the, the further back in time you go, the, the more sparse the information gets and the more guesswork you have to make, and it, the harder it is in general. Anyway, the hippies wanted to rebel, so they started playing at 415 and play, instead of 440, right? It was just as arbitrary as 440. There were no magic chakra resonances or any of that new age stuff. That's all nonsense. Um, and I think it was malevolent because it, it was a, it was two warring camps drawing a line in the sand. And the result is that people playing um, histor historical instruments like this um, couldn't play with other people who were playing modern ones um, because they were a semitone off. Like, who wants to transpose a semitone? The keys one instrument is good in are totally off from the keys the other ones are. Um, so it, it's just a nightmare, and, and it, it may be it may benefit a few woodwind players who who like that pitch um, for some instruments, but it's pretty much a nightmare for everybody else. And the poor singers who have um, perfect pitch, like I, I have colleagues who have to learn an aria twice, like learn it at 4:15 and then relearn it at 4:40 if they want to sing with a modern accompanist. Like, because it sits differently in their body and they feel it differently. So anyway, that's all academic nonsense. And I don't like the roles. I have to play with other people um, who are playing early music, so I have to tune to 415. Don't blame me. Blame not my lute. Um, so anyway, I've got the contrabass octave here. Now I can tune it to whatever key I'm in, and it's a diatonic scale in an octave. G, A. I've got a B flat on there. C, D. Those are the long strings, and I just play them open with my thumb. Uh, an analogy is the, the pedals, the foot pedals of an organ. And then the short strings are like the manuals, um, and those I fret like a normal lute or like a normal guitar. So if you take a normal guitar, a modern guitar, and if you get rid of the low E, so instead of low to high, uh, E, A, D, G, B, E, you get rid of the low E and you start with A, you have A. E, and then if you were to keep going, A. But these last two strings, I call them the first two strings, um, are down an octave out of necessity. So, instead of, why? Because they would snap. I can't tune them that high. And they couldn't back then with, um, they couldn't back then with uh, gut, and I can't do it now with uh, synthetic strings. And I wouldn't want to, because um, it's not a bug, it's a feature. 
These were accompaniment instruments mainly for accompanying singers or violinists or melody instruments, high pitched uh, 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 treble instruments mostly. So I don't, I don't want my, I don't want to have high notes that get in the middle of their range. I don't want to clutter up what they're doing. I want to hang out in my sonic space underneath a melody and uh, uh, leave space for it. Um, so it, it turns out to be a, a big advantage. Also, it uh, condenses my chord voicings and makes them nice and close together. So here's an F chord. Sorry. It sounds like I'm going up and then back down to the first note. Because the, the first and last notes are the same pitch, even though they're four strings apart. But it sounds good. And, and if you're playing it um, all at once, it doesn't sound out of order. Only if you roll it. And then it sounds pleasant anyway. And you can do cool things like you can play across strings uh, to get little ornaments like that um, without having to, to fret them at, at, um, in a linear way, like without a linear tuning. Uh, this out of, out of order tuning is called a re-entrant tuning. So one thing that happens is it compresses the chords and keeps things out of the way of the singer um, or the melodist. But the trade-off is this. Uh, you can't play scales in the normal way or they will sound like they have an octave jump in the middle. And that should sound like... But the first two notes are down an octave. So it's got that weird jump. And like it's fine if you're playing fast in an ensemble, nobody cares, but if you're isolated and people are really listening to your part, it sounds awkward. Um, so you, there's a trick uh, to get around it. Uh, you can take advantage of uh, the proximity of uh, notes on open strings. If you play strings um, that are four strings apart, on a normal lute or guitar, they're, or, or viol, uh, they're a, a seventh apart, but here they're a second. I'm sorry, they're a ninth apart, but here they're a second because it's reduced an octave. Strings four and one, and, and strings five and two. So you can take advantage of that and then um, do um, banjo rolls, basically. Um, you, you fret uh, a tetrachord of, of four consecutive notes. Um, uh, yeah. Four consecutive notes of a scale. You fret them. Um, and then you pluck them out of order. It really scrambles your brain, but it's, it's the same game that, that people were doing now on banjo. Um, but in the Baroque period, in the 17th century, people called it campanella which I like better than banjo roll, um, which sounds like something you get at a deli. Campanella means uh, bells, like a carillon tower. And they, they ring out, the notes ring out against each other. Legato, uh, like a harp, or like a piano with a pedal down. Um, so you can play a scale. Um, Sorry. I'm going to move it so you can see my right hand. That's strings 3, 1, 4, 2, 5, 1, 4, 6. <laughs> you just have to memorize these patterns. They, they are completely counterintuitive. They probably give you focal dystonia if you keep doing it for years. I don't know. We'll see. But, um, they seem counterintuitive, but they're actually extremely efficient because if you noticed, I didn't have to move my left hand at all, like in terms of shifting. 
and I didn't have to do this shreddy stuff you normally have to do to play as a whole scale. I just I get most of it just from one chord shape. I do, I do have to reach down to get that bass note. That's one grip. And then you have to open it up a little. But those are open strings. You use all the open strings to your advantage. And you just let the thing ring out. Now, I'm talking about um, reinventing the wheel. And people are doing this now, and they do it on banjo um, in the in the modern uh, bluegrass style, not in the old timey um, clawhammer style. You, you see people doing these incredible like chromatic runs and, and stuff, uh, arpeggiating out of order with their right hand. And they do that; be they can do that because the banjo is also the five string banjo is also uh, a reentrant in its tuning. So is the ukulele. So are uh, certain Latin guitars like the. Venezuelan Cuatro, um, and uh, there's a, a certain kind in northern Mexico, a, a kind of um, jarana that's like that, that kind of preserves the Baroque tradition. Um, but people in the 17th century did it on these, they did it on Baroque guitars, just guitars back then. Um, they even did it on, on, on lutes some, to, to some degree, a little bit of a less degree. But people are now also doing it on Delacasters um, and, and six-string acoustic guitars um, in Nashville, according to country music. Um, when they want to do a rhythm track, a rhythm guitar track, um, but make it thicker, they lay it down with a regular six-string guitar, and then they overdub it, um, playing the same part um, on, on, the, on a guitar with different strings. They'll buy a pack of uh, strings for a 12-string guitar, which is like the normal six, but double. And then the four bass uh, pairs of strings have a, a normal bass string and then an octave higher. And then the, the last two treble strings have uh, unison pairs. A pair of strings is uh, called a chorus or a chorus. So it's a six chorus guitar versus a six string guitar. And anyway, they, they, they ditch the regular um, six strings and they keep the, the extra uh, reinforcement set. So their four bass strings are an octave higher and then the two trebles are, are the two remaining trebles are as normal. And they put those six on a on a six string guitar. So um, and then they and then they play another uh, layer of the um, the rhythm part and when the two sound together they create a thick sound like a twelve string guitar. So that's a Nashville trick but little do they know that it was a 17th century trick. <laughs> like people just end up figuring out the same things. And um, what they can be doing also is learning Campanella patterns or banjo roll patterns, if you want to call them that, it's, it's the same thing. Um, there, there exists a lot of um, solo music from the 17th century written down in tablature um, that utilizes these Campanella scales and re-enter tunings. And it's like, uh, deciphering an encoded message um, because the, these reentered tunings are, are counterintuitive but also because the tablature systems were different and they were not standardized but that's another subject basically if you want to do the nerdy work you can you can learn all these patterns they're all um, they're all free online uh, contact me and I'll, I'll connect you with with a lot of resources um, you can play a Telecaster like this, you can play a banjo like this, um, and um, you know, if you think taking a six string guitar and putting an extra bass string or two on it are, are no-nos um, and, and a slights to history, you are wrong. You know, this thing has 14 strings, some of them have head up to 17. Um, you know, they just kept tacking stuff onto these these poor instruments and to, to give them more bass range and to but, but also to, to free up the left hand, and I'll show you that. Um, look, when I go down in my thumb, uh, I can go up with my fretting hand at the same time, or I can do the reverse. I can move in contrary motion, just like a keyboardist can very easily by moving their hands in opposite directions. That is really hard to do on a six string guitar. Um, like if 
you're playing classical guitar and you're trying to play complex music with a complicated bass line, the melody is simple enough, but the bass line is just a mess. You have to play the notes in a lot of order and, um, and, and uh, play up high all the time. And it, it's just, it, it's really a nightmare. <laughs> um, which is why a lot of classical guitarists are uh, commissioning 10 and 11 string instruments, 13, uh, just for playing Baroque music so, so they can have these harp basses. Um, and free up their left hand. So that's another cool idea that is very old um, and uh, still applicable. Um, you are not in a vacuum. You are in a moment in time where you have unprecedented access to uh, historical information via the internet and via the scholarly research. Unfortunately, a lot of the latter is gatekept by academic institutions and you have to have a uh, JSTOR access to get to it, but um, it's all out there and um, don't be afraid to ask a specialist to help you with what you're doing. If you are playing a baritone guitar or an extended range guitar, playing heavy metal or something like that, people have uh, people have foraged these paths before you and they can teach you many things. Take care.